God will see you through if you trust him. Good morning and God bless saints. Thanks for joining us this Sunday here at Roots in Christ Ministries where we live in faith and we love in Christ. Roots in Christ family, this Sunday, it's a blessing and a pleasure to have you as always. But I got to tell you, the Lord has really been moving in my heart these past couple of weeks on the topic that I'm going to preach on. And, and even I've had occasion to speak with some of you on this topic. So I, I, I'm, I'm, you're really going to hear some of our conversation, but the Lord has really been churning for me to add a little bit more. So if you would, please, we're going to be coming from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 44. Luke chapter 23, verse 44, where it reads, It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. I want to use as a subject this Sunday, enduring the darkest times of life. Enduring the darkest times of life. You know, when we talk about dark times, we... We can relate. We can relate, right? Just from a very natural standpoint. I mean, we're dealing in a society today where there's a lot that goes on in family. A lot goes on in politics. And if I can just be forthright with you, a lot goes on in life. A lot goes on in life. And if you're not careful, if you've been on earth but just for a minute, you would have had family members that have passed away. And I'm, I'm going to say even in, in recent years, I've had cousins pass away. I've had aunts pass away. And, and even uh, I'm incorporating my, my wife's family, uncles, aunts. My niece passed away from an automobile accident. My wife's father and my wife's grandmother passed away a, a week within a week from each other. I've got friends passing away. I've got friends who have children that are in jail from, from crimes. I mean, they're in prison. They're locked up. And we don't know how long they're going to be locked up. We've got friends and family who are experiencing mental breakdowns. As a matter of fact, saints, just from, let's be honest with ourselves, right? How many of us have been in situations where it seems like we've lost or on the edge of losing, yeah, our minds. Yeah, a lot of us end up there, even to the point of depression, where we just implode and we just, we, we don't want to be around anyone, we don't want to talk about anything. And, and I know, I know, I know, and you know, Pastor, I'm going to reach out every now and then, and I get it that you're going through stuff, and I get it, but you got to know that, that you're in my prayers. You're in my prayers, because I know, because I know. But here's the thing, saints, we, even with COVID, go, I mean, it, it seems like with COVID, we have family members that are separating from each other, uh, right? We've got family members that are saying that if you aren't vaccinated, well, you we don't necessarily want to fellowship out of, out of concern, right? And, and don't log off yet, right? Don't back out yet because really that's not my message for today. I'm not going to say whether or not that's right or wrong. All I'm going to say is there is division in families and division in friends and fellowship. So now we've got people that have lost jobs. We're talking about darkness, right? Dark Darkness. People's homes being foreclosed on. Spouses cheating. Spouses just all and outright neglecting family. Spouses abusing family. We've got our young folk that are living recklessly as though we've never trained them in righteousness. We've got family and friends living lascivious lifestyles. And then let's go here. Family and friends and even our kids are getting hooked on dope, on drugs. And then it doesn't help when, you know, marijuana gets legalized, right? As if we don't have it, enough issues. And then I even got to go here, but I, I'm, I'm going to say two words. We're talking about darkness, right? The government. 
That's right. That that's hood for the government. That that's all I that's all I'm gonna say about that. But you gotta know, saints, when we talk about this darkness, even looking at our text, a time period where we would expect the sun to shine, right? Because we're looking at noonday. This is typically where the sun is the brightest. And the sun is failing us. And you know, saints, a lot of times people will miss the fact, even in this text, the fact that if everyone wasn't so focused on Jesus, Maybe they would have recognized how dark it was. And let me give some clarity to what I'm saying here, right? I'm not saying that they were so focused in looking at uplifting and glorifying Jesus. I'm saying they were looking at his demise, his downfall. Well, why is that, Pastor? Well, let's be honest with this thing. Jesus was the light. He was the light. He was the light of men. But don't you know the word tells us that men loved darkness, they love darkness. So even now in the natural, when it became dark, they, it didn't even phase them. They wanted to do away with Jesus. It's no different than today. It's no different than today. People will be so focused on doing and living and dwelling in their darkness that they will even pretend like it's light, like they've been enlightened. Like they're going to new levels of enlightenment and that they know so much. But don't you know you don't know anything if you don't know the sun. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I've already identified the fact that it's kind of awkward that during the time of day where it would be the brightest, right? And I'm going to use the word weird, that it's just out and outright weird. But 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 that, that's not the only weirdness we find here. Specifically looking here at Luke chapter 23, verse 44, it says, It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, if you're not careful... We can read the text and see about the darkness, but then this temple of the curtain. Some of us, it just doesn't mean anything. Oh, well, a curtain tore. But don't you know when God moves, everything has purpose. And for my, for my, my, my scholars, my scholars, right? When we study God's word, the fact that something is in the text, there is something to be mined out of it. And you got to understand that this curtain that we're talking about, that doesn't really seem like much. Really, if you get into the book of Exodus chapter 26, mm -hmm. you'll find that God gave specific instructions on how to construct his abode for worshiping him, right? So, so this curtain, this veil that we're reading about, it separated the Holy of Holies from the tabernacle by a large veil, right? And, and even back then it was a tabernacle, but now we're talking about it separated the Holy of Holies from the temple, from the temple. And this veil was woven with linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and decorated with intricate embroidery with a big gold image of a cherubim on it, a heavenly host, a heavenly being, right? And the veil guarded the people from accessing the Ark of the Covenant and coming into the presence of God. In other words, this curtain separated the people, the average people, the average Israelite, from the presence of God. And according to the law, according to the law that God gave Moses, only the high priests could enter this most holy of holy places. And only once per year on the Day of Atonement, known as Yom Kippur. So before entering, the high priest had to wash, had to put on some special clothing, gathered incense, and the blood from a sacrificed animal. So once inside the Holy of Holies, the high priest burned incense, sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And then now what you find is this act of ceremony was completed every year, once a year. This is where the Israelites would ask God for forgiveness from their sins, right? We're talking about the, the high priest on behalf of the people. Understand, saints, this curtain, if you haven't figured it out yet, it symbolizes separation from God. And to recognize right here of all places where Jesus Christ is on the cross, this curtain 
that separated the general public was torn from the top down, straight down the middle. This curtain, it symbolizes the separation of God from man. And let's be real saints, because of our sin, we weren't worthy. We aren't worthy. We're never worthy to stand before a holy God. But understand God himself here, tearing this veil from top to bottom is inviting. He's welcoming us so that we can come to him without the mediator, mediator right? Hear what I'm talking about. This mediator of the high priest that went once a year. No, you can go and, and had to sacrifice. You're talking about some barbecue. Had to get the blood from a sacrifice and throw it on the seat. God is saying, forget all that. I'm here for you to come whenever, however you are. The thing is, people should have been celebrating and recognizing that God has availed himself to you by removing the veil with Jesus on the cross. So that brings some salient points. As decorative and as massive as this curtain was, it was made by men, but saints of God, there's nothing that a man can make that can separate you from the love of God. Also understand that this curtain also represented all of the laws, the laws that the Israelites had to live under, that God's people followed, but they failed to maintain. As a matter of fact, the word tells us that these were a stumbling block to them because it was impossible for them to live by every law. Saints of God, somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, uh, everyone has fallen short, including me. Yeah, we can go there. We can go there. But it is here through the death of Christ, the death of Christ, where God has made a way for us to go directly to him, saints, and there's no other way. There's no other way. There's no other way. So what is God doing? He's inviting us to get rid of, hear what I say, the ritualistic relationship. The ritualistic relationship, right? And I'm not talking about religion. People, Too many people want to play words. Look up the definition of religion. It's the rituals. It was the vain repetition of going through these motions, of doing these things. And then it got to the point where, where they had no meaning. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to be in a relationship with somebody where my actions have no meaning. Thank God for his Holy Spirit, for the freshness of the relationship that we have with him. A relationship where, yes, we may fall short, but God is not going to punish us with death. And here's the thing. The Jews lived under this law for 1600 years, 1600 years. But let me let me help somebody with this. Right. I remember a long time ago, I preached a sermon about this and and and. My, my description of when we talk about the law, right, is you're really talking about God talking to his children. These are children. And those of us that have children, you know, a child that has a fork and they start walking toward a light socket in the wall. It's, you're not going to sit here and explain to them, look, look, you don't want to take the fork and stick it in the socket because you can be electrocuted. Right. Because all that child is thinking hole in the wall, fork in hand. This looks like it fits. So that's where parents, no, stop, don't do, no, no, no. Good job, right? We let our children know, but, but we do it through law, right? You, well, that's not law. I mean, yes, it is. We're establishing the rules of the house. But guess what? As the child gets a little older and gets a little bit more mature, you begin to develop a relationship with the child. You begin to have expectations that they begin to understand. But here's the thing, saints, that the Israelites, after 600 years, they did not just, they just didn't seem to get it. And that's why Jesus is here. But understand when Jesus came, he says, I, he didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. Biblically, when we talk about the law, so you've got the Ten Commandments, right? Not only that, you also has, have civil law, which you find in Leviticus. Not only that, you have ceremonial law, which you find in Leviticus. You can get into the five books of the Bible as an entire entity, right? The Pentateuch, which can be seen as the law. Any statement in scripture, any word in the Bible can be the law. You better do what the Bible says. That can be law, right? God's word, anything that God says in general became law. 
a righteous standard for moral living, right? Guess what? Where do you think our laws come from? The law. God's law to man's law. And then you got a, a matter of principle or fact, which becomes law. And we're all talking about within the scripture, but understand Christ's command to the believers to love one another. To love one another. First, love him. Don't put, any, don't put anything before him, but love one another. That's, that's a law. That's a law. And that was a reference they could understand. But today, you've got to understand that we are no longer under law. We are not under the rigor of rules of do, don't do, say, don't say, wash, don't wash. We are not under these, this rigor. So if Jesus is saying, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, but he says that I've come to abolish, he says, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. What, what is he really saying? Well, if you look at Romans chapter eight, where it tells us, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free. Let me say that again, has set you free from the law of sin and death. What law? The law of sin and death. But let's be real. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do, and what law are we talking about now? We are talking about Levitical law. We're talking about Mosaic law. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his son, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering, and so condemn sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Saints of God. Let me be clear about this thing. When we begin to look at what, what, what we're reading here in the book of Romans and begin to understand the fact that if there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, there's nothing that I can do that Christ condemns me for as long as I'm in him. Let me, let me speak to the salient point, as long as I'm in him. Saints of God, what, what you'll find, in, and you need to understand that when we live in this spirit of Christ, we will fully fulfill the law because we will actually satisfy all of the requirements of what we can call the Mosaic law and the Levitical law, but all of the ceremonial laws associated within Leviticus, we're not burning any oxen, no barbecue, no need for barbecue. Jesus has already satisfied all that. He satisfied all the ceremonial law through his sacrifice. No need to sacrifice ox because Jesus was sacrificed. Somebody ought to get excited right now. Why? Because what that means is I can live a life free to live. And all I've got to do is answer to my Lord. But here's the thing, saints. It does require us being in God's word so that we know what his will is for us. Pastor, you, I knew you were going to sneak in and get into your Bible in this message. Amen. And you knew it. Here it comes. Not only can we begin to understand what God's purpose and the gravity of everything that we do and everything that we say and how he wants to move us in this life through being in his word, understand it absorbs us, it absolves us from any requirement that would have come through Levitical law. Why? Because the Levitical law had people running around saying, okay, I can do this. I can't do that. Uh, all right. Ugh, I messed up. Living in Christ. Here's the freedom. It's a conversation between you and the Lord. And you don't have to worry about being ostracized or put out of the synagogue. You don't have to worry about what he say, she say. Did you get into last week's message? You need to go back. You don't have to worry about he say or what she say. What does God say? And that's how we walk and that's how we live. Understand saints. Now that this veil is torn and now that we have direct access to Christ, Lord have mercy, I'm getting excited. Now that we have access to Christ, if you read in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, it says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Find help in time of need. Don't forget, we're, we're still in the dark. We're still dealing with darkness. And the Lord recognizes this. 
Not only does he recognize this, just from Hebrews alone, we recognize that he's extending mercy and grace because we're accustomed to living and dwelling in the darkness, but he's prepared to give us the confidence to come to God. Let me help somebody to come to the light, to come to the light where we knew that we had fallen short. Some of us have even created our own darkness. We've created our own situations. That's why I'm encouraged by James chapter 4, verse 8, where it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded saints of God. The Lord is telling us that we can come to him even as sinners. Under the law, you were supposed to die if you went before God. Under the Spirit, God accepts you how you are. But you know what he calls you to do? He calls you to repent. What is repent? Repent means make a 180 degree turn from how you're living, how you're thinking, and turn to God. Come back to him. And here's the funny thing, God's attitude towards us Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it says, The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who wishes uh, take the water of life without cost. Not only is God, and we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 22, we are talking apocalyptic. We are talking the, 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 the last day. We are talking about a time where God is inviting, and it doesn't cost you Somebody, look at your neighbor right now. Say the gift of salvation is free. It doesn't cost a thing. I told you I was excited about this Sunday, right? Let me, let me get into this. Now, I'm almost done. So here in Luke chapter 22, picking back up at 44, it says, So it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, right? So we've already talked about the, the darkness, right? Everything that's going on associated with darkness. Now, even in the midst of darkness, it seems how in this dark world, people gravitate to darkness. So it didn't even phase them. But then also we continued on where the scripture says, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And how even this, tor this temple uh, uh, um, curtain being torn in two is symbolic of the Lord saying, you know what? Get rid of this thing. Come to me, however you are, wherever you are. No need for all this ritualistic stuff. No need to live by these, these harsh laws, this legalism, right? But then as we go on here in verse 46, saints, the word tells us, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. He breathed his last. So small point again of weirdness. Here we have Jesus on his deathbed. And now, you know, typically, and I don't know if you've been around someone who was passing away, but it just seems like they just slowly fade away, right? But here Jesus himself makes a bold, loud proclamation, right? A declaration and, or a conversation with God, his father, his father, right? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Understand, saints of God, if nothing else that we need to get from this is Jesus himself at, at a dark point, at one of the darkest points. Let me help somebody at the darkest point of his entire experience of being our Lord and being our Savior. He now shifted his focus to God. He didn't focus on his circumstances. And don't miss the fact that even prior to this, Jesus had already said in, in the Garden of Gethsemane that, that he asked the Lord if the Lord would take this cup from him. But he said, not my will, your will. And now here he is. He's saying, Father, I commit my soul to you. What, what are we to get from this? We need to learn how to focus on God and not our circumstances. Understand that our trials, they should draw us closer to God, not further from him. They shouldn't separate us from him. Understand that we are not in our darkness. We are not in our trials just by happenstance. 
God has purpose for it. And here's the thing. I've already addressed the fact that some of the darkness that we, in, that we are in is because we've made bad decisions along the way. Some of the darkness that we're in is because of sin and somebody else's sin has collided with us. Guess what? Dark is dark is dark and you need light in the dark and God wants to give it to us. But here's the thing. You've got to look for him. You've got to seek him, right? Jesus here has given us the model to trust God. He's telling us that we can have God's purpose served wherever we are. What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying I don't care what you're going through. You just going to leave it like that, pastor? No, I'm not. I don't care what you're going through. What you're going through, you should always seek God to get you out and he'll get you out. Guess what? Sometimes he'll send people. Now, he, let, me, let me say this. I care for you. I care for you. He'll send people your way with a word of encouragement, with word of wisdom. Let me help somebody, even your children sometimes. What you've put into them, you need to be listening to your kids sometimes. You put it in them. According to God's righteousness. Why not listen to when they speak righteousness? Understand, saints of God, this spiritual perspective that Jesus has to focus not only on God, but he's saying, I commit my spirit to you. Now we have evidence that Jesus wasn't just thinking about this earthly, this temporal, his spirit. We know that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's where God is saying, I'm giving you what's, what's yours. I'm, I'm connecting with you. I'm coming back to you. I trust you with my spirit. Jesus' command and authority with life. He trusts with God. Not just with the moment, but with the eternal ramifications that God has prepared for us. Let me throw in this one last point. Don't miss the fact this is, these are Jesus' last words. His last words, the last thing that we will ever hear him say prior to dying on the cross was, I commit what I am. I commit who I am. I commit the substance of life, everything that I have dominion over, but most specifically my part that is eternal. I give to you, saints. That's the perfect prayer. That's the prayer that every believer should have as we go through trials. Lord, I commit my spirit to you. Even when we find ourselves at a point where it seems like we're at our wit's end, we've struggled, we've struggled, we've struggled. I just don't seem to get it. I can't seem to fathom how to put two nickels together to make 10 cents. I can't get there with my family. My wife is her. My husband is her. Our prayer that God has given us, that Jesus has given us is Father. Who are we talking to? Our Father. I commit my spirit to you. Don't, don't miss this either, saints. I, I got, I've got one more thing to get into, but, but don't miss this. That, that be, it, be it the Jews, right? The Sadducees and the Pharisees, be it, be it the government, be it all of these people that conspired against Jesus Christ None of them took his life. None of them took his life. Not even, not even the, the, the centurion that pierced his side. No one took Jesus' life. And Jesus himself told us in John chapter 10, verse 18, he says, no one can take it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. And that ought to, give us understanding and even confidence in knowing that if God has given us a promise, then why wouldn't we commit our souls to him? Why wouldn't we commit our spirits to him? If God himself has given us, hear what I say when I say this, he's given us the authority of resurrection by trusting in him 
then why are we banging our heads walking around on this earth acting like we own ourselves? You don't own yourself. We commit ourselves. We commit our spirit to the Lord. And guess what? We have a promise of resurrection through your living that as you commit your spirit to God, there will be no denying that God's purpose is being served in your life. So if you want to know the secret to enduring the darkest of times, what would Jesus do? What did he do? He committed his spirit to God. Amen. Eternal and precious Lord, we thank you for giving us this example through Jesus Christ. No better instructor of what it means, dear Lord, to trust in you. To know that you will be a deliverer. To know that you've given us and granted us all access to you. To know, dear Lord, that we don't have to be perfect according to the law, but we are made perfect through your righteousness. That we live the law of your spirit as you given it to us. Dear Lord, my prayer is that as your children, we your children, as we suffer and we go through life, we go through issues in life, give us the clear focus and the strength to remember to trust in you. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own strength. And let it not be forgotten, dear Lord, that Jesus committed his spirit to your hands. What better place to be than to be in your hand where no one can pluck us from it? To be in your hands is to be in a place where we can rest assured that your will be done for your glory. You just use us. Have your way, O oh Lord, our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.